Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we ask that you would open our hearts and minds to hear from you, that your spirit would guide us and bless us as we think about your grace to each one of us today. In Jesus' name, amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new, creature, a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. When God gets a hold of us, he changes our heart. And when he does that, we're not the same anymore. I'd like to tell you a bit about Dave from Beloit, Wisconsin. I've talked to Dave about sharing some of his experience, and he said, sure, I'm, I'm welcome to do that. He said he would like to have others not go through what he went through to come back to God. When I first met Dave, um, it was the old Dave. You've probably known people who had the old person and the new. Through the years, I've met a number of people where the new person was all I ever met. The old was gone before I ever met them. And some of those people have surprised me quite a little. Uh, I remember uh, Deacon Ed in Minnesota. Uh, Deacon Ed was a faithful, loyal Adventist uh, Always did the right things, reliable, trustworthy. I never suspected till someone told me that Deacon Ed had once been the town drunk <laughs> until God got a hold of him and changed him. I only knew the new Deacon Ed. I didn't know the old town drunk Ed. And I've known other people that way too, where I only met them in their newly recreated form. But with Dave from Beloit, I first knew him in the old Dave form. Dave grew up as a Seventh-day Adventist. In fact, he helped his dad build the gymnasium at Wisconsin Academy many years ago when he was a teenager. But he had not uh, followed God's ways throughout his life and he felt far from God. Uh, and as he explained parts of his life to me, I think his assessment was right. He was not walking close to God. He was not following God's will. But he knew he wasn't. And something inside him was uncomfortable about that. And, and he knew he ought to be going to church. And so every few months, and it could have even been a year or two, he would show up in church, but he did it as a hard duty. <laughs> he was always glad to get it done, but it didn't make him happier to have done it. He came in unhappy, uh, and you could tell it. I'm not that great at telling how people are feeling. <laughs> My wife is a lot better at that than I am. But when Dave walked in, I could tell he was not a happy man. It looked like he brought a storm cloud in with him. And when he left, he still looked like he had a storm cloud with him. He was not a happy man when he came, nor when he left. He knew that he was not living the way God wanted him to live. Dave had some pretty strong personality traits that not everyone would have appreciated. <laughs> as, as he explained, it was Dave's way or the highway. You did what he wanted or he had no time for you. He was very argumentative and demanding with his wife Patsy, easily upset and cursed a lot when he got upset. But the Lord was beginning to work on Dave whether he knew it or not. He was trying to get Dave back. Now, Dave was in his mid-70s. I don't know exactly how old he was, but he said he was past his four score and ten, <laughs> which the Bible promises. Uh, and uh, he had 
run out the clock on the regular lifetime. And uh, he, he felt like his life didn't match God's expectations and there was no hope for him. One time when he showed up at church, he asked me, has the Holy Spirit abandoned me? Is there any hope for me? Now, I thought he was asking this as a somewhat theological question. So I answered it as a theological question as best I knew. Uh, and the, Holy, the Lord had taught me about this some time before, a number of years before, that, that if, the, if you are still wondering if there's hope for you, then there's something inside of you that still cares, still wants salvation, still wants better things for your life. And if you still want something better, then it's not too late. And the one who's prompting you to think about these things has to be the Holy Spirit. It's not going to be the other side. It's going to be God's side prompting you to want something better for your life. So no, the Holy Spirit has not left you. He's working on you right now, trying to get you to come back. I had no idea that Dave was thinking of suicide. He was so low, he thought there was no hope at all, and he was about to end it all. I didn't know. He could hardly believe that the Holy Spirit hadn't actually left him. I kind of know that feeling from spots in my own life. Why would God forgive me? I wouldn't forgive me right now. <laughs> and Dave felt that way. Why would God forgive me? But his hope revived. And uh, he asked God to forgive him. And felt very distinctly that God had forgiven him and accepted him back. And he committed himself to a restored relationship with God. He said that when he felt the forgiveness and acceptance from God, it felt like a blanket wrapped around his soul. And he said, I never want to lose that again. I never want to lose that again. All of a sudden, Dave was a different man. Before, although he knew many of the things God wanted in his life, he wasn't doing them. He wasn't doing them. He rarely prayed, probably never read his Bible. And now, he started praying. <laughs> like, every day, all through the day. He read his Bible a lot. And in relationship to doing God's will, no longer was it a, a, a list of rules that he looked at and said, oh, man, look at all that stuff I'm supposed to do and not getting any of it done. It shifted from the things he ought to do to wanting to do what pleases my heavenly father. Wow, what a difference that made in Dave's life. The cursing. He, he talked to me about that, and he said, ah, hit my hand when I was working on my truck. He was a mechanic and doing body work. He was retired, but still doing mechanical and body work in his garage. And uh, he'd bang a knuckle or hurt his hand. And he, he used to say that he'd kind of burn the paint off the walls in the shop with his words afterward. And, but then he'd feel it coming and he'd, and he'd just cut it off before it came out. And he was talking to me about that, like what an amazing victory it was that the curse words didn't get out. And I kind of smiled and I said, you know, the day's going to come when you won't even feel like cursing. You should have seen his face. <laughs> he was so shocked at that thought. I don't think he could take in that concept at the moment. He, he was completely surprised by the idea that that could ever happen. Sometime later, he shared with me he'd been working trying to fix a, a ceiling 
spot on his um, shop where the sheetrock had been damaged and he was trying to put a new piece up. So he's up on the ladder trying to get the sheetrock up, dropped his hammer. Went down, got the hammer, brought it back up. Working around again, dropped the hammer again, went down, got the hammer, brought it back up. Drops the sheetrock. Well, it didn't smash it completely, but he goes down, gets it, brings it back up, works on it all. When he finally got done, came down off the ladder, it struck him. He never once thought of cursing. It didn't even enter his mind. Dave was a new man. Now, he says, when frustrations come, he has a quiet place in his mind where God is, and he goes in there into his presence and calms his soul. God was changing Dave. Dave was a new man. But Dave was such a new man that Dave didn't even recognize who he was sometimes. <laughs> the, the Holy Spirit would be prompting him to do this or that. Uh, I want you to study the Bible more. I want you to do this. And he came to me saying, is that the Holy Spirit? <laughs> and I had to say, yes, Dave, that's the Holy Spirit talking to you. Uh, and I find that very uh, interesting. I don't remember anybody else I worked with where their conversion experience was so clear and the change so broad that they didn't even understand what was happening. And I had to explain to them what was happening. Uh, with Dave, that's what it was. He had to come to me to tell him what he was experiencing. He was experiencing it. It was real. There was no question about that, but he just didn't fully understand it. Dave had something of a struggle before uh, he was baptized. And part of it was still that sense of, will God accept me or reject me? If it was me, I wouldn't forgive me. Why would God forgive me? And he felt kind of the same about the church. Will the church accept me or reject me? The church he thought, will be saying, we know this guy. He's bad. <laughs> we, we can't accept this guy. But the Beloit Church was good to Dave. They, they always welcomed him. In fact, they were always pleased to see him. In, in fact, along with me, they were just tickled pink to watch the changes happening in Dave's life. It was such an enjoyable thing to watch. Uh, and they were important in helping to pull Dave in. He said at his baptism, he felt like a ton of bricks were lifted off of him. He knew he was in the presence of his heavenly father who loved him. Uh, the, the new Dave, he explained to me some of the differences. In Beloit, there's a place where a four-lane road narrows down to a two-lane. Crosses a creek, takes a turn, uh, and uh, goes into a 25-mile-an-hour zone from a 40-mile-an-hour zone. It's a bottleneck. And the old Dave, if he was coming toward that bottleneck and someone started to try to pass him, he said the old Dave would have hit the gas and gunned it. No, you don't. You don't pass Dave. The new Dave... Somebody comes right up beside him trying to pass just before that bottleneck, and he just kind of let him go. He didn't care. He didn't even care. One Sabbath morning, as he was driving into church, he said, I was just feeling so happy to be on my way to enjoy the fellowship with my church family. This is the Dave who hated to go to church and only went because he had to and left relieved that he'd gotten the duty done for a time, but not really happy even then. That's the old Dave. But the new Dave could hardly wait to get to church, to be with his church family. And as he was going along, 
He was just enjoying a Sabbath morning, and he was doing 45 in a 55 zone, which is not the old day. <laughs> the old day always was pushing a little past the limit, and uh, he was following somebody who was going slow, but he didn't care. He didn't care. They're going 45. He's going 45. Didn't matter. The old Dave would have gunned it and passed. I don't. He wouldn't have cared if it was a double yellow line. Probably he'd have, he'd have been on his way. But no, not 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 the new Dave. He was just enjoying the idea of being with his church family. He started treating Patsy differently. Patsy once asked him once asked him if she could borrow his car. I forget exactly what it was, but the new Dave said, sure. And she was just kind of shocked. <laughs> she fully expected a drawn-out, antagonistic argument about why she would ever need to borrow his car, et cetera, et cetera. And then the new Dave, sure, <laughs> you can take the car. Patsy, I think, liked the new Dave. <laughs> He was working on a project with an a old pickup truck in his uh, garage, doing some body work on it, uh, and going to repaint the, the, the vehicle. And it was going rough. He said, at first, I blamed God. Then I blamed the devil. And then I decided I needed to learn patience. And then I realized... There was actually an easier way to do the whole thing if I'd have done it that way from the beginning. <laughs> and I think he kind of knew from the beginning that the other way would probably be easier, but chose. And now he was learning patience. Yes, learning patience. Um, as he was learning to listen to God and the Spirit talking to him, he got very curious about the Holy Spirit, wanted to learn more about it, and asked me if there was something he could do to learn more about the Holy Spirit. Well, that was several years ago, and right at that moment, we had just started a new quarter in Sabbath school about the Holy Spirit, who was prompting Dave to ask about how to learn about the Holy Spirit. When he heard that we had a lesson every Sabbath morning at 9.30 at Sabbath school on the Holy Spirit, he felt like he'd hit a gold mine. He was there in Sabbath school, uh, participated in it, enjoyed it thoroughly, uh, and you can't keep him away from Sabbath school ever since. The, the Lord drew him in, and he loves it now. He's discovered the book Steps to Christ uh, and devoured it. Now for Dave, that's a little something, because I think Dave didn't find reading all that easy. My suspicion was that reading came hard for Dave. Uh, and he stumbled a bit when he read out loud. But the Lord turned him to the book Steps to Christ, and, and he just couldn't get enough of it. Before he was baptized, uh, the, the issue of understanding righteousness justification, sanctification came up. He'd never understood it before and never cared. But now, he wanted to know what they were, the differences, how they were related. And he said to me, I don't want a quick answer. I want verses. Well, I went home and I thought, what's wrong with a quick answer? I like quick answers. A couple of precise verses that, that kind of cover the turf and nail it down. And, and, and what's, wrong with, what's wrong with a quick answer? But then I realized, I've been watching the Holy Spirit work on Dave. When he doesn't even realize it, that it's the Holy Spirit. And I think it's the Holy Spirit prompting him to ask for verses. So I'd better give him verses. So I just collected everything I could find about righteousness, justification, sanctification. And, and it got nearly a page, yeah, probably three-fourths of a page, single-spaced verses on those topics. And I went 
to study it with him with just a list of verses. <laughs> As we were working our way down, I think we got to about the middle of the page, over halfway with the list of verses I had, and I realized it wasn't clicking. He wasn't getting it. It wasn't making sense. And I was going to run out of verses on the page <laughs> before he understood it if something didn't change. And I remember not exactly what I said, but praying about that. Saying, Lord, I'm in trouble here. Dave asked for verses, and I think you prompted that from the Holy Spirit, and that's what I'm doing. But it hasn't gotten through. It hasn't clarified. I can't clarify it. I can't make him understand this. You're going to have to do that. And we're running out of verses here pretty quick. But before we got to the end of the list, Dave says, I've got it. I've got it. And could explain it back to me, how they all related. Yeah? He did need verses. And no, I couldn't explain it to him. Uh, but the Spirit knew how he was going to explain it to Dave. And the Spirit knew I had to come with a list of verses. So he told Dave to ask, which he did. And he had finally figured out how God's grace works. Dave told me he was past the three score and ten. And he says, I'm so thankful that God gave me the extra years so I'd have time to come back to him. I wasn't walking with him before, and he passed his three score and ten, still not walking with God. But he does now. That sense of God's presence is in a, indispensable to him, that, that sense of the soul wrapped in a blanket. Um, God says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. And Dave has a heart at peace with his heavenly father. And it has made all the difference in the world to him. He says he felt like standing on a street corner and telling people what God had done for him. Because he knew they wouldn't listen. But God put a burden on his heart to talk to his brother-in-law. Now, I think this was Patsy's brother. Uh, but the brother-in-law and sister-in-law, and Patsy and Dave, uh, shared two adjoining campsites along the Sugar River near Broadhead, Wisconsin. And they liked to go out there for the weekends, have their campfires, and sit on the, the little verandas and chat. Uh, and there was a growing urge in Dave to share with his brother-in-law. He had no idea how to begin. He had no idea what to say. But finally, his brother-in-law asked him some question that started the conversation. And Dave got to share what God was doing in his life. Now, I think the brother-in-law knew that Dave was changing. <laughs> It was pretty hard not to know that. Patsy knew it. Uh, and if you are relatives in the next campsite over, you're going to know it too. Because Dave was not the same as he used to be. Now Dave prays frequently through the day. Talks to God whatever he's doing at the time. Reads the Bible a lot. And for Dave, that's amazing. Uh, he read the book of Revelation one Sabbath afternoon. <laughs> read through the whole thing. He says, whenever I feel like there's trouble, I sing Jesus loves me. He has faith now and says we all need that. Pleased to go to church where it used to be a painful duty. Loves doing God's will because that's what his heavenly father who has forgiven him and accepted him back. That's what his heavenly father wants him to do. 
And, and Dave says, if my experience can spare someone else that long pain before they come back to God, I'd be happy to have my story shared. God doesn't want us living out of harmony with him. It, it's awkward. It's painful. It's painful to us and to him. He wants us back in happy harmony with himself. He wants all his children back in happy harmony with himself. He wants all of us to enjoy eternity in that harmony with himself. Dave says, I'm so glad God gave me those extra years past 70 so I could come back to him again. And my prayer is that each of us will walk with God as Dave learned to walk with God. And we'll learn to share that with other people so they can walk with their Heavenly Father as well. Thank you.